I, I want to play another clip which gets at a different uh, a different theme that you guys have in your consulting and in your writing, uh, which is about brand building and specifically how you went about building the Barefoot Wine brand. Michael Houlihan drove to the far end of the Piggly Wiggly parking lot in Columbia, South Carolina. That's what he did in every parking lot, and it's what all good salespeople do. Park as far away as they can. The spots by the door are for customers. Store managers notice the courtesy. It was mid-May. The sky loomed thick and close, a dark, steely, greenish gray. Michael didn't so much see the clouds as feel them, hot, heavy, and steamy. It was the kind of day that discourages movement. Ah, spring in the American South. Michael is a tall man, six foot two, a bit gangly, with reddish hair and an air that says he spent some time on a surfboard. He was wearing a dark suit, carrying barefoot wine samples in a bag over his shoulder, and holding a large foam core sign with a five-foot-tall purple foot. This was not a guy they saw every day at the Piggly Wiggly. When Michael had driven up, a dark-haired teenager was collecting stray shopping carts and wheeling them back to the store. By the time Michael started lugging his wine and sign across the 30-yard lot, the kid had abandoned his carts and was sprinting for the supermarket door. Hey, buddy, you better run. Say what? Run? Michael looked left and right. All he saw were parked cars. Did he hear the kid right? Then, boom! The thunderclap almost knocked him over. Michael felt it in his spine. Whoa, what was that? He stood there, shaking it off. Maybe five seconds later, it began to rain. Not gentle, soothing, wimpy spring rain like he knew in Northern California. This was rain from a fire hose or a falling river. Buckets and buckets in seconds. Drops that fell like walnuts. <sighs> Got it. In seconds, his suit was soaked. His tie was soaked. His shoes and socks and pockets filled with water. He started running for the store. Then came the wind. Huge, uneven blasts blowing hard from the left, then hard from the right. Michael's sign turned into a sail. It yanked him west halfway across the parking lot. Then it pulled him east. Then another gust pulled him west again. He was hanging on, figuring if he let go, the sign would land in Georgia. Left, right, lurch, wobble. Just don't let go. Inside the store, people had stopped. No one was checking out or bagging groceries or moving. They were watching this tall, fair-haired, California-looking guy in a suit, getting hammered by rain and staggering back and forth, wrestling with a giant purple foot. He disappeared out of view for a moment, then reappeared and heaved off in the other direction. He was barely making progress towards the door. The whole show took maybe four minutes. Michael tottered into the store through the automatic doors and just stood there for a second, catching his breath. He was leaking water onto the floor like a broken barrel. He looked up. The whole store, the shoppers, the clerks, the bag boys, the kid who'd been pushing carts stared at him wide-eyed. No one moved, just people staring. Michael stared back, dazed and dripping. That was the only sound, the dripping. No cash registers, no rustling, no chatter, just drip, drip, drip. Above them, out of the ceiling, that supermarket mechanical voice broke in. Wet mop, up front. A few seconds later, the store manager, a tall man with a southern gentleman's manner, walked up to Michael. Son, I know you have something to sell me, and I know you want to sell it real bad. Yes, sir, I do. Okay, so yeah, I mean, it, exciting to hear how you were building the brand. Tell us more, uh, if you want to elaborate on this clip for us, that would be wonderful. Well, once again, uh, before we get into the content of the clip, you notice how you could actually hear the thunderclap. You could hear the rain. Uh, you can, you know, you can hear, hear the southern accent. Uh, you, you can hear the cash registers and the noise of the supermarket. So you're right there. Uh, you can hear the guy pushing the carts around with that, you know, clanky, tinny sound that they make, uh, you know, the, in the parking lot when the, when the, uh, when the shopping carts are collected. Uh, but, but in the scene, what you notice is that the proponent, which is the character that plays Michael Houlihan, is doing what he has to do 
to sell the wine. Yes, he's the president and CEO of the company. Big deal. He has to <laughs> get out there with his five foot sign, weather the wind and the storm and the rain and get it in there and make a presentation to a store because, you know, his distributor isn't going to do it. Nobody else is going to do it. He doesn't have a ton of money to hire a bunch of people. So he's out there doing it himself. And where is he doing? He lives in he lives in San Francisco, but he's making this sta- sale in Columbia, South Carolina, for God's sake, on the other side of the continent. And so, this the real message uh, in this clip is: you do what you got to do. Yes. So many people go into business today; they have preconceived ideas about the business, about what the job will be like, and what the work will be like. And then they get into it and they go, you know, I didn't sign up for that. Well, I'm sorry. (laughs) You still got to do it. (laughs) I think that's that's a great uh, transition into my next question about pivoting and and making changes to your strategy over time. Because you started started small, very small, and then grew a large business. And and we can imagine in, in most cases when that happens, you have strategies and then you have to kind of shift or change those strategies over time. And I think you were just speaking to that to some extent, doing what you have to do. But I, I'd like to maybe hear more for our audience about about that, about uh, your strategies and, and how you may have ch- had to change strategies over time to ultimately grow the business. Well, one of the things that we love to do, one of the things that we love to do is, is to put the lessons in story form. So if I could tell you a short story that's also in the book, in the audio book, as well as the paperback, is as we're growing our business, we're looking for what's called low-hanging fruit. So where is our product going to sell the fastest? Okay, and we thought, how about Hawaii? People are always walking on the beach, so it's like free advertising with the bare footprints on the beach. So Michael made a trip that direction. He went to Hawaii. He rode with the salespeople of this distributor that we had there, and he sold in every account. Oh, they were so happy to have that lovely wine and a great price. And uh, he came back, and he was pretty excited, and we'd shipped a truckload of wine over there to fill all the orders, but we didn't get any reorders. So he said, I guess I'd better go back and see what's going on. So he went back and visited all the accounts. Well, the product had sold through. The the retailers were delighted. They said, oh, yeah, we sold it right through, as if that was the end of the story, right? Well, why didn't you put it back on the shelf? Oh, it was new. I guess I forgot. He looks at the salesperson from the distributorship, and, you know, like he didn't care whether it was on the shelf or not. He was selling something else that month. So he put the, something else on the shelf where our product had been. Well, he resold and restocked all those stores and came back and said, I think I've got that. But no, it had happened again. So as he's preparing to go back to Hawaii and leaving me to juggle payables and receivables, I said, you know, I don't think so. Look at this report. This is how much it costs for you to go to Hawaii. And this is what we're making. The big lesson there was that in order for us to expand to territories outside of where we could physically drive to and from right here where we live in Northern California, we had to have somebody on our team. And it's what we called our wine cop. We had to have a salesperson in every territory to work with the distributor, the retailer, to work with the end user and to work in the communities where those people came from to support what it was that they were concerned about. So again, we had to put ourselves in everyone's shoes, but we couldn't do it unless we had somebody on the ground in those territories where we grew our product. We had to get a great reputation wherever our product was released. We had to do that by really policing the situation with distributors, retailers, and users in the community. Yeah, a lot of people get involved in this sell, 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 but they don't realize it's really service, service, service. Yes, it is. You know, because 
everything you've sold needs to be serviced sooner or later, whether that service is to get a reorder or to take back a spoil or to make sure the price is right or to make sure it's well positioned in the store or if it's programmed or if it's on ad or whatever. Uh, I would say one of the big wake up calls that we faced was, oh my God, look at all this work we have to do that we didn't plan on. I or, thought somebody else was going to do or, that. Or we get, a, we get a little bit ahead, you know, like, hey, look at this. We're $50,000 ahead. You know, what do you want to do? You want to buy something like a new car or something? <laughs> no, we need to have uh, a rep up in Oregon. And, you know, he needs $50,000 base salary before he's working on his commission. And before you know it, we realize that every dime that we're making has to go into growth. Yes. See, because there's only two directions in that stream out there. You can go upstream or you can get washed out to sea. You can't tread water. So it's a very interesting wake-up call once you get into business and find out what you really have to do. Sure. <laughs> yeah, I think I, I love that's a profound, uh, important statement that everything you sell has to be serviced. I think that's yes. such a such an imp such an important lesson, and also you know the part of your story. It's been my experience in consulting with various clients that are starting up uh, consumer goods companies that, um, yeah, you can't expect the distributors and the retailers to uh, merchandise your product appropriately or, or uh, That's right. make sure that the reorders happen. Um, even if your product is doing really well, it is often the case. They'll just check that box and move on to something else. And so you, you, you've got to police it, as you said. And, yes. and I think that's an yeah. Yeah, important lesson. It's a popularly in held misconception. There's a lot of popularly held misconceptions out there when it comes to business. And I think we've been victim to most of them. I think we'd, we've <laughs> acted on most of them. <laughs> yeah. So, so yes, we, we talk a lot about those types of, of misconceptions in our book and in our audio book.